Wow. Th thank you all for coming out uh, during your lunchtime, during a school week day. I, it really does mean a lot. And it really, and I want to thank Lizette and just UCLA in general. This is my first book signing or um, lecture for this one. So you're going to have to bear with me while I work out my stump speech as we work along. In other words, here we're going to experiment what's actually going to work with the rest of the country so I could just repeat it again and again. Although if you've ever heard me talk, you know no two speeches are alike just because I like to ramble as much as possible. But I really want to thank Lizette for having this, well, this amazing resource of a library, the Chicano Studies Resource Library. I have yet to really go through all of its uh, archives. Uh, I do plan to one glorious day, just spend an entire day here nerding it up. But I do remember when I first came here and I asked Lizette, like, so what, what do you have on food? And she's like, uh, I don't really think we have much. And I immediately la regañé, so I scolded her for that. But that said, for this, you know, in, I guess, in honor of me coming here, there's actually a great exhibit outside. So not in this room, but the other side, there's a great exhibit of old, uh, cookbooks, old artifacts, old, uh, what was the one that really caught my eye? What was the beard? Don Jose, uh, Trader Jose's, yeah, Trader Jose's beard from Trader Joe's. Yeah, for, oh, well, yeah, she drank the beer, so, but you see the little holder. So even in Trader Joe's, you have Trader Jose. Now there is this allure of Mexican food all across the United States. My name is Gustavo Ariano, and of course, the other reason why I'm really happy to be here is because I, I am a Bruin. I got my master's in Latin American studies with an emphasis in history, sociology, and anthropology back in 2003. Last year, I taught, uh, I, I, I was a, you know, distinguished fellow with, uh, with you know, Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies here. So that's really, you know, and then the, the year before that, I was the commencement speaker here at UCLA. So it's really awesome to just Every year, there's something really awesome that brings me up here to Westwood that makes me brave the 405 freeway and all its horrible traffic all the way from Orange County. No, but it really is an honor to be here. So I am a Bruin, first and foremost, for today. Uh, I'm the editor of the OC Weekly. At the OC Weekly, we're the sister paper to LA Weekly. With, since we're such a small paper, I still do multiple things for the paper. So I'm the food editor for the paper. I've been the food editor since 2002. I'm still an investigative reporter. Uh, what gets me the most notoriety is a column that I do called Ask a Mexican, which is exactly what it sounds like. People send me questions about Mexicans and I answer them. Doesn't matter what kind of questions they are, I answer them and then some. That column comes out in 30, eh, 39, I think maybe 40 newspapers across the country now. Has been around since 2004. Um, I come out regularly, regularly on KPCC, on Air Talk with Larry Mantle, on Good Food with Evan Kleiman. You could hear me sub for Sonali Kohatkar every once in a while on KPFK. Uh, I used to have a show there for a while. We're trying to work on getting me back there because it was really fun to have one hour to talk about whatever the hell I wanted. It's a lot of fun. Um, what else can I talk about myself? My op-eds come out every once in a while in the Los Angeles Times, although I haven't been there in a while. Also for Marketplace. Um, other, you know, I'll, I'll write for anyone who gives me a check, basically. So, and, and even if you don't give me a check, I'll still write for you. I love to, uh, I love to write, love to write, love to write. And then the final thing I'll say about my uh, professional career is, if you like anything I have to say today, be my fan on Facebook. So, some, you can't be my friend any, anymore. Some of you are my friend because I've reached that magical 5,000 limit, whatever. I don't know why they have that. But if you go to Ask a Mexican, you could type it in and anyone could fan me there. So, please fan me. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Twitter's at Gustavo Ariano. Uh, just follow me, I guess. Just, just read all my stuff. Um, but here I am here to talk about this book, which if any of you have heard me talk for the past four years, I've been promising it again and again and again. Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America. And it, I, I, I'm a believer in literal titles, so it's literally what it sounds like. It's How Mexican Food Conquered America. In, in the book talks about the many, many different ways in which Mexican food did that. And not just via the, what we already know, it's the Taco Bells, the Chipotle, all that Mexican fast food that so many of us like to deride as inauthentic and disgusting, but really the, our, America's relationship with Mexican food goes much, much deeper than just what is in the fast food. In fact, from the moment that Americans have tasted Mexican food, from the moment that Americans have tasted Mexican flavors, they have become immediately obsessed with it. Immedi so obsessed, in fact, that what has happened in this, the, what I call the course of Mexican food history in this country, it's really like, it's really like a clock. You have Mexican food, the Americans have, have Mexican food in front of them, they eat it, they love it, then they absorb it, 
and then they ask, okay, what's next? It's all, not literal digestive absorption, okay? But yeah, I know. But I mean, literally, they, they, they assimilate it into the American diet. Then they think, okay, what's next? What's the next great Mexican dish out there? Because in the American mind, they know that there's always gonna be more and better Mexican food somewhere in the horizon. And this is something that has happened in this country for 125 years, even longer than that. If we, if we accept and remember that, ch that chocolate and vanilla are indigenous Mexican products, of course, no one ever thinks of them as Mexican anymore. You might see a vague reference here and there like, oh yeah, the Aztecs and the Mayans used to smoke chocolate or drink chocolate, but not the way we do it today. But so from that beginning, right up through the 1880s, all the way up to today, it's always a cycle of the newest dish, be the newest dish being absorbed, becoming an American meal and going on forth. And the best example I have for that is, of course, what we all call chili. You know, you have chili cook-offs, you buy it from a can. It's so Americanized at this point that almost everyone has forgotten that chili was originally chile con carne, and chile con carne came from Mexican women in San Antonio from the 1860s onwards. And so, so it's something that's gone on and on again. And you think about all the different types of Mexican food that is in this country that, yeah, we know it's Mexican food, but it's also so commonplace now that we forget again that how Mexican it really is. Uh, chips, tortilla chips, to, whether it's Tostitos, whether it's Fritos, whether it's Doritos that were invented at Disneyland in the 1960s. That is all Mexican food, all created by Mexicans. Margaritas, well, the, the most popular cocktail in the United States, a cocktail that you could find everywhere from New York to Los Angeles to uh, Weatherford, Oklahoma. One time I was driving back on I-40, stopping this roadside American diner, and lo and behold on the menu, margaritas. Neon green, but nevertheless, margaritas. Um, tacos, of course, burritos, enchiladas, hot sauce, hot sauce. We all know that, that truism that salsa supplanted a ketchup as America's top selling condiment back in 1993 in a, in a monumental uh, achievement that the New York Times called the manifest destiny of good taste. Uh, it's, it's something that's been going on again and again and again in this country. So this book, it's not so much a straightforward chronological history of Mexican food. You, you, will, you will see that, especially with trends, but the way I love to study history is not so much a chrono history as chronology, but history as thematic, history as cyclical. And so the book, the way it's written, it's broken up into chapters, obviously, but chapters that focus on a specific theme. So for instance, the first chapter, which I'm gonna read a brief excerpt from, it talks about the indigenous foods that Mexico gifted to the world, the chili peppers, tomate, uh, vanilla, chocolate, and others, and just how you know the Spaniards and the Europeans and everyone else just took in, just spread it all across the globe. Uh, another chapter deals with America's, especially here in, in Los Angeles, I, I mean, we could talk about just Los Angeles Mexican food forever, but right now everyone's all, a Twitter about food trucks and Lux Loncheras and oh yeah, you know, the food trucks are finally cool and you know, it's no longer just Mexicans that like food trucks. <laughs> but a century ago, we were going, no, 120 years ago, Los Angeles was going through that same phenomenon, except the fast food item of choice wasn't the taco, it was a tamal. It was, they were from tam tamale wagons that would set up close to where La Placita is down in Olvera Street and just c cover the streets and go all across Southern California. So again, it's cyclical. We think, we think uh, Lux Loncheras are cool and hip and you know, only Americans kind of like them. No, a century ago it was the exact same thing. Uh, so I talk about the tamale and, th and that was at a time where across the United States it wasn't tamale wagons that were spreading across the country, it was tamale men. And it wasn't just Mexicanos who were going all across the United States, it was African Americans, it was working class white folks, it was immigrants spreading all across the United States going to, from San Francisco to Chicago to New York and then spreading. They were a staple of the American landscape for decades. And of course, that history has been completely forgotten from the American history books. Although you see glimmers here and there, for instance, if any of you who like a streetcar named Desire, you'll remember that Blanche Dubois got scared by a tamale man, you know, shouting out the red hots. Uh, those of us who love Robert Johnson, his great song, Hot Tamales and the Red Hot, you know, little, little hints of that, that we don't even think as Mexican history anymore. We just think as just regular history. And onward and onward, the, the book goes on telling all these stories, a history of El Torito, which we all love to deride as inauthentic, but was started by a Mexicano named Larry Cano, probably Lorenzo, but he goes by Larry, so we'll call him Larry. Um, Larry Cano, 
born in East Los Angeles, created his first El Torito in Encino during the 1970s, was in a war with another restaurant named Chichi's, which of course isn't coming from California, came from Minnesota, in the fight for the American palate of that sit-down combo platter type of cuisine. We t I talk about the margarita, the spread of margarita, the evolution of tequila from basically what Americans would consider rock gut to now a really, tr I mean, now, geez, tequila is now so popular that you have uh, Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos doing those horrible commercials for 1800 tequila, trying to tell us, I know what real tequila is, <laughs> not Patron or these other things. For, uh, gosh, Patron or Cabo Wabo. You have Sammy Hagar uh, of Van Halen, who's already a millionaire many times over, becoming even richer by selling his Cabo Wabo tequila, for, you know, and onward and onward, gosh, so many stories to tell. Southwestern cuisine, uh, the rise of the Southwestern movement during the 1980s, even though, of course, New Mexican cuisine, it's its whole other trip. That's why I devote, I devote a chapter to it. Southwestern food never, nevertheless masqueraded as Mexican food across the United States. And that's actually the one trend that didn't have staying power. The only, the only staying power of, Southwestern, of the Southwestern food movement is something called the Santa Fe chicken salad or the Southwestern salad. And as far as I could tell, the only thing Southwestern about it is, you know, it has multicolored tortilla, tortilla chips on it. You tell the people in Santa Fe, there's a chicken salad named after them, and they say, we don't eat chicken salad. We don't know where that came from. That was, I, I, did I find, I find out where it started? Might have started in Los Angeles. But nevertheless, you do have right now one of the best chefs in Los Angeles, John Sedler, who has his Rivera restaurant. He was a star of the Southwestern movement during the 80s. Now he's just a star of Latin cuisine, period. So if, if you haven't been to his Rivera restaurant, it's a little bit pricey, but it really is a wonderful homage to Latin cuisine across the United States. Uh, you talk about, I talk about Tex-Mex food. Of course, Tex-Mex forever derided as inauthentic, forever derided as somehow an imitator. And I think that comes mostly because people, everyone hates Texas, except Texans themselves. <laughs> so we like to deride it. But at the same time, at the same time, that's not a fair assessment, which I'll get to in a little bit. Right now, we're in the middle of a burrito renaissance. Chipotle, of course, it's like the hipster uh, food stuff at the time. These massive foil wrap burritos that come from a, a, a company in Denver but a company in Denver making burritos like they do in the Mission District in San Francisco. So I tell the story behind that. And also, how is it that America only discovered the burritos in, in reality in the 1990s when the burrito has been here in the United States since at least the, the 1940s? And the first consumers of burritos in, in, in mass, the braceros. The bracero program, the, 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 farm, the, not the farmers, they would feed burritos to braceros and the thinking that, hey, they're Mexicans, they're, they like tortillas, they like beans, they'll eat them, and the braceros hated them. You see them in the historical records, they absolutely despise burritos, but they were the first in mass consumers of, me of burritos in this country. Supermarkets, of course, hot sauce, as I said, dominates the American uh, pantry, but not just hot sauce, but, and not just recently. Since the 1900s, Americans have been wanting to give Mexican food that American tang, going so far as to actually eating canned... That's the closest I've been able to find it. Old El Paso doesn't make canned tortillas anymore. They sold them for decades. Rosaritas doesn't make them. And so I do profiles of some, some of those great companies, Rosaritas, um, El Faraón, and onward and onward. Talk about the tortilla, of course. I take you to uh, where Jesus appeared in a tortilla in Lake Arthur, New Mexico. I, um, gosh, what else so much? Tequila, of course. And talk about the, what I think are the five greatest Mexican meals in the United States. I might read a little bit about that. And onward and onward. And one of the, one of the discoveries I made in the book Ed, uh, is this question of authenticity. We all love to say that's authentic, that's not authentic. I used to be one of those zealots. Oh, of course, I talk about Mexican cookbooks and Mexican cooking. And this, you know, only in America can you have two people like Rick Bayless and Diana Kennedy being the undisputed champions of quote unquote authentic Mexican cooking. So what exactly is Mexican cook, or, you know, is authentic Mexican cooking? Again, I thought I was one of those zealots who went on and on about saying, this is not Mexican, that's not Mexican. But in the course of doing research for my book, I eventually I eventually came across, I actually borrowed a concept that we know in Chicano studies, which was uh, pioneered by the great Chicano scholar Américo Paredes, this idea of greater Mexico, 
that Mexico and Mexican culture doesn't stop right there at the U.S.-Mexican border, no matter how much Mexican elites or American know-nothings might want it to say, you know, want it to be. No, Mexican culture goes wherever there's Mexican influence, and that's going to be wherever there are Mexicans and their, uh, their culture. So similarly, with, um, with, American with Mexican food in this country, most of that cuisine was started by Mexicans. It most of, I mean, you could tr literally trace a particular food stuff. It wasn't just some American that out of nowhere created Mexican food. No, they got the idea from a Mexican and then they sold it to other people. Most of the times it was Americans. Like Taco Bell, for instance, we all love to deride Taco Bell, but that taco came from a, another, re, you know, quote unquote, real taco. And that restaurant where Glenn Bell stole the, the taco recipe that created Taco Bell, it's still around. It's called Meet La Cafe. It's all the way out in San Bernardino, celebrating its 75th anniversary, the oldest Mexican restaurant in the Inland Empire. Do I like Taco Bell? No, it's absolutely disgusting. I cannot stand it at all. I'm a huge fan of Doritos. I had a lot of hope for the Doritos Loco Taco. I really did. I tasted it. No. I think it could work if we eliminate Taco Bell from that equation. In other words, you sell Dorito Locos taco shell, maybe give it to Del Taco or, you know, King Taco. It could be an amazing, amazing taco, but Taco Bell doesn't work. However, is Taco Bell and Acapulcos and El Torito and all these other cuisines, are they Mexican restaurants? Absolutely. It is a type of Mexican restaurant or it is, it is a type of Mexican food. Just like in Mexico, you have different types of regional traditions, Zacatecano food, Chilango food, Sinaloan food, Oaxacan food. Up here in the United States, we have our own regional tr Mexican traditions. And the best example I could give, I actually talk about in the book, and it happens here in Los Angeles. We all know the famous uh, Oaxacan restaurant, Gelaguetza, run by the Lopez family, who's actually going to be tonight at La Plaza for my evening book signing. And I talk in this book about the rise of regional Mexican food in the United States, which we're still, we're still experiencing. As we have more Mexicans coming in from regions that traditionally didn't migrate to this country, so we're talking about Southern Mexico, the interior, the coastal states, and we're starting to get their cuisine in this country. And really the launching point for this is Southern California. And the pioneers in making me regional Mexican cuisine mainstream was Gelaguetza. So in the book, I talk about how Fernando Lopez, the patriarch of the family, he opened, he started off in Koreatown with a cart selling tlayudas and tamales de mole, which of course are all amazing. Then he opened up his restaurant, and at first, the only people who had patronized his restaurants were Oaxacans and their bosses from the west side of Los Angeles. In other words, you would have these Oaxacan maids or gardeners telling their bosses, hey, come, come, come to a restaurant that serves the food that I like to eat, that I make for your family. And so uh, Fernando would talk, you know, he, would, he talked about how bewildered it was to see BMWs and Mercedes parking into this little ramshackle restaurant right there in Koreatown. And you have these Anglo families coming in loving Tlayudas. However, quote unquote, other Mexicans? No, they would not step into Gelaguetza because for them, oh, it's Oaxacan food, sucios Oaxaqueños and Indios. For them, Oaxacan cuisine wasn't Mexican food. It was somehow inauthentic Mexican food. And of course, the, the Oaxacans had the last laugh because Oaxacan food is now uh, acknowledged as one of the treasures of, of, of just worldwide cuisine. So this idea then for me that somehow one cuisine is authentic and the other isn't, no, it's all a matter of where you're placed because if Mexicans can deride our quote unquote our own Mexican food as somehow being authentic and inauthentic, then of course we're, other people are going to try to do that with other types of cuisine. Let me read you a short excerpt uh, from the book. And since we're at UCLA, let's keep it in the UCLA family. So this excerpt comes from, where is it? Is this it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So this, this is actually from the first chapter of my book, um, which talks about, again, Mexico's contributions to worldwide cuisine. It talks about uh, chocolate and specific. So the book opens, the chapter opens up with El Cristo, de, El, El Rey del Cacao. We all know the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico, but you know, her dejected son is El Rey de Cacao, which is basically a statue of Jesus dejected holding cacao leaves. Uh, the Spaniard, the Spanish priest, God bless their souls, they told the Indians, hey, uh, you need to give him alms in the form of cacao beans and that'll, you know, that'll make the church you know, that'll create the church. And so that's what happened. El Cristo, El Rey del Cacao is still there. So that's just the opening. But here, 
I go away from Mexico City and go right here to uh, El Sereno neighborhood and I talk to one of our, again, one of our own from UCLA, Marcos Aguilar, who is the head of Academia Semillas del Pueblo. So let me start reading. Let me see how long. Okay, cool. So there's a chocolate museum in Canada, nearly a dozen in France, and even one in Estonia. Hershey's keeps a public repository of its history, as, as does Cadbury in England, German's Ritter Sport, and the Peregrina brand of Italy. Nestle keeps two, in Switzerland and Mexico City. But the world's premier exhibition on chocolate is Choco Story, the Chocolate Museum, in a 15th century four-story building in Brussels, Belgium. The Belgian confectionery concern, Belcolide, or however you pronounce it, underwrites a project, but it's impressively objective in recounting chocolate's past, present, and future via exhibits that range from, the computer, from computer screens and artifacts to mannequins dressed as conquistadors, standing on a mini-galleon and appearing ready to pounce off and rush onward toward empire. They have a second museum in Prague and organize chocolate festivals across Europe, but Brussels is a place to visit, four, store, four floors of chocolate madness, and it's expanding. Choc Choco Story is hardly a pretentious place, but it's far removed in presentation and monetary investment from the drink drinkable museum offered by the people behind the Academia Semillas del Pueblo, Seeds of the People Academy, a charter school in the working class El Sereno neighborhood of Los Angeles. Pupils learn English and Spanish, but also Mandarin Chinese and Nahuatl, along with Mayan concepts of mathematics in addition to the reading, writing, and arithmetic of public education. It's a brave experiment in self-sustainability and one that's working. A high school is in the, work, in the works to continue Semilla del Pueblo's work and they operate Chocolatel Café, a coffee shop where they're trying to return mankind to the original chocolate, the elixir of Mont Montezuma's court, to save the sweet treat from what, it, what its popularity has wrought upon itself. Obviously, Chocolatel Café, Café had to close to the public, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's almost too quixotic a venture, given modern-day chocolate's multi-billion dollar world, world, uh, worldwide stranglehold on the cocoa industry. But you haven't tried chocolate until you, you've tried Chocolatl's version. And if you're a guest of Semillas principal Marcos Aguilar, a tall slender man with jet black hair slipped back and tied into a ponytail that hangs down to his back, you will. Even if he's in a pinstripe suit, Blackberry constantly pinging new, new alerts, Aguilar will, will whip up the old school drink. He'll grab cocoa paste, untreated and without sugar, and place it in a metal container pouring boiling water spiked with chile on top. In goes a jigger of aguamiel, the sap of the maguey plant that, in another incarnation, serves as the base for the ancient alcoholic beverage pulque. Then comes the whisking, immediately furious yet increasing in intensity as every second adds up into two minutes. Aguilar pours the chocolate into a clay mug and places it on the table. His eyes are penetrating but kind as he waits for you to sip. The first feature of Aguilar's hot chocolate that tweaks the senses is the foam, unadulterated cocoa butter, velvety and invigorating. Candy makers discard most of the cocoa butter when producing their chocolate bars, so to taste gobs of the stuff is akin to capturing the mythical angel's share of distilled alcohol, the portion of every barrel that naturally evaporates. The next comes the watery sweetness of the aguamiel, followed by the chile water's subtle kick. Chocolate seems almost an afterthought in this drink, but only because the modern human palate is accustomed to snickers and kisses and virtually every cocoa concoction except in its rawest, purest, most intoxicating form. The postprandial buzz makes a double shot espresso seem as jolting as a droplet of water. The world needs to remember this drink, Aguilar says, with the conviction of a bodhisattva who has just experienced nirvana but won't be content until everyone has. The world will know this drink. So I'll skip over a little bit, just I talk about chocolates, really quick history of chocolate, and then get back to Aguilar then. So Aguilar starts talking about chocolate. Chocolate on its own, as the ancients used to prepare it, is incredible and healthy, Aguilar says. But the Spaniards changed it. They added sh milk and sugar. And then Nestle and Hershey changed it even more. It's, basically, it's now basically all sugar, and of course, that's all unhealthy. He looks at a tray of chocolate nibs, roasted and deshelled but otherwise unprocessed, that an assistant laid out before him. They're small and dark. The nibs smell more like caffeine than anything Western nostrils know as chocolate, and the flavor is somewhere between charcoal and caramelized onions. They're not soft at all, harder than biting through a sunflower seed, and grainy like coffee grounds once they break down on the tongue, but the zip they possess, nearly electric. Chocolate's essence seeps into every taste bud. Anyone who grabs a couple will snack on them until they're gone. I didn't know what chocolate was until tasting these, Aguilar says. And these are just the nibs. The nibs. When I learned the proper ways, chocolate became incredible. 
Aguilar first encountered the arch archaic ways of chocolate ma making while a student at the University of California at Los Angeles in the 1990s. At a party he attended, guests from the Zapotec tribe of southern Mexico bought balls of chocolate paste to prepare for their hosts on a chilly night. The clean taste and effortless yet intricate preparation, one that hadn't changed substantially from the Mayas, stunned Aguilar. He was used to Mexican hot chocolate, specifically the Abuelita brand owned by Nestle, so it's not Mexican folks, it's Nestle, that dominates the Mexican hot chocolate market. Tasting the Zapotec chocolate, Aguilar said, speaking in a soft voice that's nevertheless, nevertheless authoritative, was like a part of my ancestors suddenly came back from the dead and demanded I not only acknowledge them, but bring them back from obscurity. Over the following years, Aguilar tinkered with his own chocolate recipes. Shortly after helping to open Semillas in 2002, Aguilar and his board decided that merely educating children wasn't enough. They also needed life skills after graduating and better if it involved their heritage. Chocolate El Café, now closed to the public, unfortunately, but still operating for students and community fundraisers, tapped into a growing network of Chicano-themed coffee shops in Southern California. Antigua Coffee House in nearby Cypress Park, Tia Chucha's Café, of course, run by author Luis Rodriguez, and Café Calacas in Santana, nearly all run by first and second generation Latinos who were longtime community activists and who wanted the societal trappings of café culture, but with a marked political bent. Small Latino Chicano coffee houses provide the alternative settings versus conglomerates, says Yancy Quiñones, one of the people behind Antigua and an advisor to Chocolatl in its early days, a space to showcase our culture and to involve community interaction. I also believe it's an opportunity to have a sustainable business in our neighborhoods and the pathway to Latino entrepreneurial and cultural advantages. Part of that commitment for Aguilar, Quiñones and others also meant going down to southern Mexico and working directly with farmers to source organic chocolate, costlier but necessary. He traveled to Chiapas to heirloom chocolate farms that development had yet to swallow, farmed by people whose families tilled the land uninterrupted since the heydays of the Maya. But before debuting Chocolatl to the public in December 2009, Aguilar had one constituency he needed to please, said me as his students. He had them taste his chocolate, then took them to IHOP to try their hot chocolate. Aguilar still chuckles when remembering the field trip. One boy said, it tastes like you're biting into a spoonful of sugar, the principal says, of IHOP's limp effort. Aguilar is also working with or incorporating heirloom vanilla from the Totonax, from Veracruz, from the Veracruz region, the originators of uh, vanilla, and plans other culinary projects, all to reacquaint Mexicans with the food of their ancestors. The concept of Mexican food is you don't think of Mexican food as healthy or organic, he says. Yet this is the birthplace of chocolate. Chocolate in its, pure, in its purest form is healthy. You see the stereotypes of Mexicans getting too drunk for parties? It wasn't like that. Before, our ancestors, our ancestors used chocolate as a beverage of choice during festivities. It was a wonderful thing, and we need to remind people about this. Yet such lofty goals face a race against time, economics, and development. Two-thirds of the world's cocoa production is in Africa, with Mexico accounting for less than 2% of the industry. Organic cocoa production, like what Aguilar favors, represents less than half of 1% of the world's total, total product. In Mexico's chocolate-growing regions, the government encourages cacao farmers to chop down their trees and grow soybeans and bananas for the international market, developments that sat in Aguilar. As in any trauma, the only thing that'll help you survive is resilience, Aguilar says. And it's a testament to the resilience of Mexican food and the culture that it survives. When you look at the chemical properties, chocolate offers resilience, antioxidants, theobromine. That's symbolic. There's a recovery from that exhaustion. And to do it in our, on our terms is important. Liberation comes through the stomach. It comes through what we eat and how we eat it. The principal stops, realizing he's now sounding much more dogmatic then someone trying to get people to enjoy food needs to sound. Aguilar smiles. And on top of that, our chocolatl is really good. So that's just one excerpt out of many excerpts. Um, I could go on and on, but I'd rather get your questions right now instead of me going on and on. So raise your hands and let's have at it. Right here. A couple of questions. <coughs> the tortillas in the can, is that flour or, or corn? Corn tortillas. Corn tortillas in a can. Um, Apparently, according to the people who have eaten them, they tasted very chalky. You heat them up, you put them, and then you eat them. But when, you know, when push came to shave, or rather, when push came to shove, you had to eat, have your tortillas. So people would subject themselves to that. And the second question is, uh, have you noticed a, a variation of the same 
name of food, like a taco and the uh, regional variations uh, in, in uh, the way that it's produced? What's interesting about the taco, of course, Mexicans, we've been stuffing food into a tortilla since the beginning of the tortilla, so thousands and thousands of years. But that dish didn't get the name taco until the late 1800s. Bef the, the, before the word taco meant everything from a uh, pool billiard to a little stick of dynamite to somebody getting drunk. It wasn't until the 1880s that th that taco came to be what we now know as a taco. So once it came up here to the United States, taco, the name kind of kept itself, but in how it spread, there's many, many different variations. Here in the United States, I mean, you have the taco dorado, which of course, you know, say potato tacos, freshly fried, the hard shell taco, which is the taco that you could find at Taco Bell. Well, I, well, I think most Mexicans nowadays refer to default as a taco, but I guess technically you call it a soft taco. Uh, you have the puffy taco of San Antonio, which you could also find at Arturo Puffy Taco in Whittier, where they get a fresh corn tortilla, just freshly made. They dunk it in the fryer, so it puffs up. So it's almost like the way I describe it, it's like a gordita and a tortilla decided to marry and try to become a taco, but then they got bored, so halfway they just ended up puffy. Um, there's taquitos, of course, flautas, although what we call taquitos in El Paso, they call them roll tacos. Uh, my favorite taco on the planet, the taco acorazado, uh, which is in Spanish or in English, you uh, translate it as a battleship taco, which is a specialty of Cuernavaca. I don't think... I'm sure you can find it here in Los Angeles in the, in the loncheros because Cuernavaca, people from Cuernavaca, they dominate the lonchero industry. But the ones I always go to is in Santa Ana at Alebrijes, which is a pink taco truck. Amazing food. Um, the, the one dish, I mean, in terms of other meals that might have changed names. So the taco, for the most part, kept its name. Of course, there's a, the classic, the tamal turned into a tamale. But same thing with like chili. Chile con carne turned into chili. You just anglicize it. Um, the burrito has mostly stayed the burrito, except in Denver. In Denver, they, they have a burrito. They, so you get a regular burrito of beans and chicharrones. You put a hamburger patty inside in the middle, and then you serve it on a plate. And what we would call it a wet burrito, they call it a smothered burrito because they cover it with, with what's essentially orange gravy. And it's, you think it's orange gravy, so oh, it's just like gravy, but it like, will burn the hell out of you. So they call that a Mexican hamburger. It's not a burrito, it's a Mexican hamburger. And these, Mex I actually just wrote an essay for Westward, which is a sister paper of LA Weekly called Mexican Hamburger Helper, how I, le how I learned to stop worrying and love Denmex cuisine. Um, we all know our, re I mean, we know Tex-Mex, we know Cal-Mex, Sonoran food, of course, and then New Mexico cuisine. No one knows what the hell Denmex is. And so in, in the book, I mean, there they wrap their chile rellenos, they wrap them in wontons and wonton wrappers. And that's how they eat chile rellenos, whether it's a Chicano restaurant well, from people who've been there for centuries or recently arrived new Mexican restaurant. They, they all serve Mexican hamburgers and they all serve chile rellenos Denver style. And, but they think that they're, and this is, what, this is one thing that I found interesting about doing this book, since there are so many different regional traditions, everyone thinks their food is Mexican food and everyone's always surprised when they realize that their food hasn't traveled to other places. Best example I could give, here in Southern California, we eat breakfast burritos. I go to San Antonio, they have breakfast tacos, small little flour tortillas with eggs, eggs and ham, eggs and bacon, eggs and potatoes. So I tell them, where are breakfast burritos? They tell me, what's a breakfast burrito? So I explain it to them and they, then they tell me, why would you guys eat breakfast burritos? Breakfast tacos, that makes sense. Breakfast burritos don't make any sense. Of course, I tell that story to us here. For the most part, we're like, you know, what's a breakfast taco with flour tortillas? Corn tortillas, sure, you call that a breakfast. All Mexicans do. But in a flour tortilla, no, but that's how they eat it in San Antonio. So for, we would consider breakfast, and really they become popular up in Austin, but they start, well, really, really, they started in the Valley, in the Rio Grande Valley, and just made their way up. Like almost all Tex-Mex food started in the Valley and went up. So again, who am I to tell a Mexicano in San Antonio, that their breakfast taco is somehow inauthentic, while my massive bref breakfast burrito that I buy from Athenian Burgers Number no. 3 in Buena Park, <laughs> that's somehow authentically Mexican. Other questions? Don't be shy. My sister. From UCLA, another grad of UCLA. So you see Kearns going into the horchata and the guayaba juice industry, and then you see Doritos, like 20 variations of Flaming Hot, and now Takis is mainstream here. Any figures on the economy of... It, it all depends. Obviously, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Salsa alone is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, 
Taco Bell alone, multi-billion dollar industry. And, uh, and that's one thing that I talk about in this book, also the, commodifi the, the commodification of Mexican food. So Americans love their Mexican food, but they, uh, so what you get then is entrepreneurs that wanna mass produce it as cheaply as possible and as quickly as possible. The first people to do that were the Chicago canning companies from the 1890s, where they can chile con carne, which of course now we call chili, but they also can tamales. Um, have, I, I wanna, they still make canned tamales, I wanna taste them, I've never had them before, but they, so what, the way they would make them would be these small little individual tamales, which the workers would make fresh, and then sometimes they would be corn husks, sometimes not, then they would just can them. But in San Francisco, a guy made an invention, he got a patent for a tamale making machine, which essentially would get the can, would line the can with masa, and then right in the middle, they would just plop in some meat. So you see like a, a cut through of it, it looks like, like a bone with bone marrow inside of it, that's exactly like how it looked like. And so what Americans would do, they'd open up the can, they'd plop it down, they'd heat it, that's their tamal. But those types of tamales, it became a multi-million dollar industry spread across the United States and that was Mexican food. That's what served as Mexican food. And that's in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, there was this one company, uh, it was called, Ix well, we would call it Ixel Tamales, but if you're from San Francisco, you know Ixel is 49. So 49ers Tamales spread all across the globe and they were still around for, you know, up until a couple of decades ago. Some people still remember them, but that was the Mexican food of the time. And it happens again and again. Uh, in the book, when I talk about El Torito and uh, Chichis and, you know, Acapulcos and those types of restaurants, during the 1970s, you had mega companies like Kraft, like Philip Morris, buying up these restaurants. I talk about one restaurant, Casa Gallardo. Casa Gallardo was created in St. Louis or St. Louis by a, uh, a Chilango, somebody from Mexico City named Ramon Gallardo. He had no experience whatsoever with Mexican food, but he was working as a busboy in a Mexican restaurant in St. Louis called La Sala. I guess the manager quit, so the owner of the restaurant said, hey, you're a Mexican, start cooking, like take it over. So he got his experience a couple years later. He opened just one restaurant, Casa Gallardo. That one restaurant, I think it was, was it Philip Morris? It, but it was a mega company that had nothing to do with Mexican food. They bought him out for a multi-million dollar offering. Basically, Mexican food in the 70s and 80s, there was a, you know, it was the internet IPOs of, of then. In fact, uh, like Facebook, just people buying up stuff with no, like no real track record. In the 1980s, um, Time Magazine did an article called The Enchilada Millionaires. And this is the 1980s saying, hey, Mexican food's starting to become popular now. And this is back in the 1980s already talking about these multi-million dollar industries. And that's something that just, just continues again and again. Look at what's happening now, as you said, with last year, uh, the Frito-Lay company entered into agreement with the Tapatio family, the Saavedras, who have their, uh, who have their, uh, their plant here in Vernon. We all, in, qu in quick, uh, quick, not quick, qu uh, sorry, quick trivia. We all think Tapatio is called Tapatio because we figure, oh, the family must be from Jalisco. No, they're, they're actually from Mexico City. The dad, he just named them because his children happened to be born in Jalisco, but they're all, they're very proud Chilangos and mm -hmm. just like how we know Chilangos to be. And I'll leave it at that. But so they entered into agreement with Kraft, not just with Frito-Lay, but with Kraft. Kraft is now this year, I think, starting to distribute little packets of tapatio across. So, uh, you know, w when there's money to be made and there's always money to be made in Mexican food, you'll have the spreading of Mexican food. Again, not just a recent phenomenon, but something been going on over a century. Other questions? In the back. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about the chile relleno that was wrapped in wonton shell. In a wonton wrapper, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, Mexican food on its own, and this is, this is another thing I have to talk about the authenticity, the authenticity game. Mexican food is a mestizo, it's a mestizo food. If people want to eat authentically Mexican, you're, you basically have to strip away any beef, lamb, or chicken, rice, tequila, dairy products, because that was all brought forth with the Spaniards during the conquest. So you're basically reduced to tamales, tortillas, michiote, uh, chapulines, that's not a bad existence, don't get me wrong, I can live on that forever, but you're you know, very much reduced to. So Mexican food has always been com a matter of com combination. Uh, Al Pastor, of course, was brought over by Lebanese immigrants to central Mexico during the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then up here in the United States, the most famous uh, fusion food right now are Korean tacos, which everyone assumes, oh, created by Koji, but no, one, I mean, 
Korean students here in the United States have been cooking Korean tacos for a, a, one or two generations. You know, one of the first restaurants that served Korean tacos was Jose Bernstein's right here on the UCLA campus. True story. Um, but before that, so everyone thinks, oh, you know, there's now this fusion because Mexican food has finally became a, become a part of the United States. But in the 1970s, you had Polish tacos in San Antonio, people cutting up kielbasas, putting them in tacos. Here in Los Angeles, the kosher burrito, the, the beautiful marriage of Jewish and Latino traditions probably originating somewhere on the east side in Boyle Heights. Now we just call it the pastrami burrito. Um, and also, one thing that has really vexed, one thing that has vexed uh, food historians for a long time, if you go down to the Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, you'll have an African-American tradition of tamales. So everyone has been, you know, historians have been trying to wonder forever, how is it that African-Americans started serving tamales as their own food? And so there's all sorts of theories going around. My theory is that it came from Chicago because Chicago, they have their own particular tamale tradition that's different from the rest of the United States. Well, I was able to track in my book how a man from San Francisco basically took 20 Mexicans out to Chicago, created a huge tamalero concern. Within like three weeks, he had 500 tamaleros all across Chicago. This is 1892, a year before the Colombian World's Ex Exposition, so the, you know, the World's Fair. And so eventually, though, all those Mexicans ended up leaving and African-Americans took up the trade. So we always talk about how the Delta Blues went up to Chicago, oops, went up to Chicago to create, you know, Chicago Blues. So my theory is, similarly, whenever you have migrations, it's not just one way, it's both ways. So my theory is that those tamales from Chicago ended up into the Delta. And if you compare them side by side, they look almost exactly the same. So there's always going to be a mixing of tradition. Mexican hamburger, of course, mixing of American and Mexican food. The other great one that, um, that we know here in California, but people still don't know around the United States, bacon wrapped hot dogs, whether you call them danger dogs, street dogs, border dogs, they're actually Sonoran dogs. So in the 1960s, for some reason in Sonora, people start selling hot dogs on the streets, bacon wrapped and a kind of bolillo, tricked up uh, bolillo, uh, not just a, a hot dog bun. They modify it to put some beans, some chiles, whatever, crosses over into Tucson around the 1970s or so, then it hops back into Tijuana, and Tijuana, of course, it's wonderful street food culture. They expand it, they make it bigger, and then it's been going up I-5 ever since. You know, so the bacon-wrapped hot dog, bacon, hot dog, that's an American dish. That is an American dish, yet it is quintessentially a Mexican dish as well, the way it got modified in the, in the Sonoran dog. And so you compare the Sonoran dog that you, like, I'm gonna go to Tucson this weekend, and I'm gonna go, I love the Sonoran dogs there, but they're small, they're like this small, regular hot dog uh, wiener, but here, of course, make them humongous. And it's no, you don't, I don't even know anyone who gets them with a hot dog a wiener anymore. You get a Frankfurt, you get a kielbasa, you'll get some Cajun sausage, and then you put a mound of grilled onions and jalapenos and all this mustard and tapatio. And you, we just go, we trick it out. We absolutely trick it out. If you, if you want to get anthropological about it, you always have to say, of course, Southern California, we always have to expand everything. We, we always, it's like custom culture. We get our cars, we make them bigger, we put ri spinning rims on it, and there you go. That's what we did to the hot dog. A um, couple more questions. All the way in the back. Um, you say that you talk about uh, how it conquered America, but it seems like you're focusing more on like, the United States. I lived in Argentina for about four years, and I have so many funny food stories of Mexican food, but there's no Mexican food. I mean, there's not even beans. In, in Argentina. I don't know if you ever traveled throughout South America and Central America and maybe made some comparisons. Yeah, I, I w originally I wanted to do a chapter going, you know, traveling around the world to find Mexican food because Mexican food is now, it really has, is conquering the globe. I mean, if you really want to get down to it, the tomato, chocolate, and vanilla, that alone are amazing contributions to worldwide cuisine. But it, when it comes to quote unquote Mexican food, it's also doing its long march across the globe. You can find Mexican food in Mongolia, in Sweden, they love tacos, hard shell tacos. I actually got an, I got an email from a Swedish guy asking if he could use my Ask a Mexican logo to sell burritos for his burrito restaurant that he was opening because he told me burritos are starting to become popular in Sweden. And I told him no, only because like, how am I, how am I gonna get my lifetime supply of burritos? Only if I'm in Sweden, no. I, you know, I need royalties from, burrito royalties. I'm not into, into it for the money. Um, there's gotta be another book out, the academic, Basically, the academic twin to this, Planet Taco by Jeffrey Pilcher, who's an amazing uh, scholar of Mexican food uh, out of the University of Minnesota. So he's going to release that, I think, August or September. But he delves more into worldwide food. Here, I, just 
For space constraint, I couldn't do it there. I mean, there was other things that I wanted to do with the book, but I just wanted to focus specifically on Mexican food in the United States. And of course, I barely talk about Mexican food in Mexico only because that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole encyclopedia. And what I only talk about in the context of how Mexican food moved up through the migration paths of Mexicans and influenced Mexican food up here or American eating traditions for that matter. Is there any way uh, the general public can go to Sevillas and have a cup of chocolate other than waiting for a benefit at the school? <laughs> Sevillas in Long Beach? Uh, no. Oh, Sevilla, Sevilla, Sevilla. Um, I'm talking about Sev Sevilla, that Spanish, that really bad Spanish restaurant in Long Beach? No. Um, I would contact uh, the principal, Marcos. I'm sure he'd be willing to do that, especially as a fundraiser. It's amazing, amazing chocolate. If any of you ever had a chance to go to, uh, you know, Semillas del Pueblo, the, the Chocolate Cafe, it was such a loss that they had to, you know, not, not close it down, but basically not have it open to the public anymore because the Chocolate was just absolutely spectacular. I mean, I love Mexican hot chocolate, don't get me wrong. It has a really good taste to it, but you compare it to from you know ground up and even making it it's a whole art form you whisk it super fast you have you know you mix it up you see the you know the, the mayan glyphs and that really the mayan glyphs and how they would prepare chocolate they do it almost exactly the same so it's not just great food it's ritual it's history that you get to drink and so i would contact the school uh, may, you know maybe during a fundraiser they just you know pay pay a couple bucks for a good cause and have the most amazing chocolate of your life and i guarantee you once people start reading the book some barista is going to go, hmm. In fact, it happens already. You, you go to like Starbucks or Trader Joe's, they, they, they serve you these, como se dice, uh, like almost like hockey pucks, hockey pucks of unrefined Mexican chocolate. And they have in recipes on how to make your own Mexican chocolate, just like the Mayans did. And that's one thing, actually, I forgot to say. Although I don't believe in questions of authenticity, that's, or I don't believe in the idea of authenticity, that has that, is been, that has been the main engine for Americans to consume Mexican food. I think I might have said this earlier. This idea that the Mexican food in front of me is really good, but I know there's something better on the horizon. There's something more authentic. I got to eat like the Mexicans live. Maybe not with Mexicans next to me or made by Mexicans, but I need to eat their food. And that, that's what has always driven American taste in Mexican food. The profe. Yeah, I wanted to, again, I wanted to do a whole chapter, but then in reading, and you know, anyone who knows me, I know I'm like beyond political and all crazy and all that, but in reading the book, I just thought that by including that chapter, it would just, it would be not, I don't mind jarring, but it just would seem so out of place that everyone would say, oh, he's just including it just for the hell of it. So instead of doing a chapter, this is my dedication. To all the Mexican workers, busboys and waitresses, line cooks and sous chefs, janitors and crop pickers, and so many more who toil anonymously in our food industry, making American cuisine even more Mexican than we can ever realize. At the very least, I want to do a shout out to them because yes, Mexican, American food is so Mexicanized at this point, it's, you know, from the very bottom all the way through all the different methods of production. And there's some amazing stories of, you know, of Mexican, uh, Mexican immigrants going through you know, the, the canning industry. In fact, the book starts with, uh, it starts in, uh, with a burrito in out, outer space with, um, what's his name? Because he's in the news right now. Uh, Jose Hernandez, he's running for Congress right now, but uh, of course, uh, some, a certain political party is trying to say that he's not really American. We know what party that is. Um, but he used to pick crops in the Central Valley as a kid, and then he ended up becoming an astronaut and making burritos in outer space. And I know that's sort of a lighthearted approach, but of course, the, the American industry, it, food industry, is the Mexican food industry in this country, outside of what we eat, but people who consume it. Other questions? Two more questions, and then it's 2 o'clock. Right here. Another UCLA grad, Adrian. Gustavo, I was, I was just in our home state, Zacatecas, in North Central Mexico. And last week being uh, Semana Santa, I had some delicious capirotada. Mm. Can you explain to folks what capirotada is and maybe the history behind capirotada, which is... Which I'm still not familiar with. Capirotada is a type of bread pudding that Mexicans, Mexican Catholics, if we want to be specific, uh, historically make during Lent. It is amazing. You get what, what do you get? You get some uh, sweet potatoes, you get some cheese, you get bread that you harden and then you make it all wet, you put some uh, uh, raisins, some almonds. People could modify it. And so you only make it during Lent. And I, 
you know, I love Lent because you get all these great Mexican food traditions. You get the tacos de papa, you get chile rellenos with the accompanying potato soup. At least that's how we eat it in Zacatecas. You get, uh, of course, the uh, uh, tortas de camarón, which is basically ground up shrimp that you make into these almost like hush puppies in a way. And then you serve them with nopales and this really thick broth. Um, so the history of capirotada, I don't really know that history. I know it's, it's, it dates back from Spain. I want to know the etymology of it. I'm a huge fan of etymologies. I haven't studied that yet, but it's, it's something that you'll mostly only see made at home. Has any of you, have any of you ever seen it at a restaurant? Capirotada? No. It sounds like sopa in, in New Mexico. Like New sopa? Mexico. Sopa in New Mexico. I don't think I've had that yet. And of course, New Mexico has its own Lenten food traditions. Um, I'm going to use what's a bad word for most Mexicans, but in, in New Mexico, they have this amazing brown sugar pudding called panocha, which for the rest of us here, like, oh my God, but that's what it's called. And so excuse the double entendres here, please, but panocha is absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh. During Lent, no, no, during Lent, you see all these roadside stands selling, you know, it says, panocha, 50 cents. And so the Mexican in me is like, but that's a New Mexican tradition. That is a New Mexican tradition. And it's amazing, 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 amazing uh, pudding. Yes. Pudding. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, yeah, so, so the history of Capirotada, again, there, there needs to be a real, a, an English study of Mexican food in Mexico. That needs to be done. I don't know if Pilcher is going to do that. I don't think he is because he's, he's looking more at the globalized traditions. But also just in general, so much of Mexican food, so much of food history in general is still unrealized, especially Mexican food history. Doing this book, what, I mean, it took me three years. It could have taken me a little bit less if I didn't have a million other jobs I was doing. But there was so much research that had to be done. And I love doing research, but for the most part, it was research that, no one had ever done. I had to try. I had to tread down paths no one had ever created because no one really ever cared about the history of Mexican food, especially here in Southern California. It's it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. All the history that's been disappeared. Larry Cano, for instance, the founder of El Torito, he's 80 some years old. No one had ever interviewed him about his career. Oh, no, only one time, a trade magazine back in 1993. No one had ever interviewed him. Now the Cal State Fulton Center for Oral and Public History took down his history. That's awesome and all that. Same thing with Doritos. Last year, this, this is a good example of, let's see, this and one more question, then we're done. Um, really good example of how skewed Mexican food history is in this country. So last year, Arch West passed away. He was a longtime executive for Frito-Lay, and all, everyone said, yeah, you know, Arch West was a person who introduced Doritos into the United States, and they all told the same story, that Arch West went to vacation here in Southern California and he went to a Mexi uh, Mexican restaurant which was a shack they're always nameless and they're always shacks in San Diego and he tasted these you know like these uh, tortilla chips with seasoning and then he went back to Frito-Lay and gave them the idea every single newspaper in their obituary, obituary said that that is an absolute lie I found the real tale but completely by accident I had no idea what happened so what happened I did a piece for the Los Angeles Times last year about the tamale wagons of Southern California. So I talked to one guy named Michael Morales, his grandfather, Alejandro Morales. He was a tamalero from Anaheim who ended up creating a company called Alex Foods. They used to make a type of tamale that I guess was really popular in Southern California called XLNT tamales. Frank remembers them. Maybe some other folks don't do. They still make them. I've never tasted them before. So I'm talking about his dad's, his, his grandparents' history and also remembers the factory. The factory used to be on what's now Carl Karcher Way and Lemon Street, this big Mexican food factory. So I'm talking about the family's history. Then he says, oh yeah, you know, my family, we still have the contract for food at Disneyland for, for not just for Casa de Fritos, which was Disneyland's first Mexican restaurant opened just a couple of months after Disneyland's opening. And it was, of course, a, you know, sponsored by Frito-Lay. So everything was all Fritos. So he starts telling me this story. Yeah, we used to um, package all their food. And then one day, one of our workers, he noticed that the workers there were just throwing away the uh, tortillas that ripped up. So he told them, why don't you fry them and put some seasoning on them and then give them to your uh, customers. So they did that. After a year, they became wildly pop popular. Then Arch West comes around, says, what the hell are these tortilla chips doing here? The, this is not Fritos. But once it was explained to him how popular they were, then he goes to Frito-Lay, explains it to them. One year later, Doritos comes and just explodes it. And now the family wasn't, you know, the family wasn't resentful. What ended up happening, Michael told me, they used to, 
Eventually, for a while, they just stopped all Mexican food production, just did nothing but Doritos 24 hours around the clock. And then, uh, then uh, Doritos or Frito-Lay realized how, uh, how much of a moneymaker Doritos were, so they took away their, their contract and they built, a co they built a factory in, of all places, Birmingham, Alabama. I know. So, but, you know, Morales is like, yeah, you know, it kind of sucked that we lost a contract, but whatever. But that story had never been told before. And at first I thought, okay, you know, people always like to pat themselves on the back. But then I interviewed the daughter of Elmer Doolin, the founder of Doritos, Kalita Doolin, and she verified the story. So here you have the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, all these people telling the same lie again and again and again, just repeating whatever people tell them. But what do we say in journalism? If your mom loves you, check it out. So always be skeptical about everything. So yeah, so I'll, you know, so I encourage those, you know, those of you who are Chicano studies majors or in anthropology and sociology or history, just food studies, that's a place, especially here in Southern California. One final question. And then after that, we'll be selling books over there. You know, they're going to the UCLA store. I'm not making a cent out of this and that's perfectly fine. Question right here. Do you have any good restaurant suggestions in Los Angeles for us? Do I have any good <laughs> restaurant suggestions in Los Best Angeles for us? Oh geez, where to begin? Um, you have to go to Gelaguetza. Gelaguetza, of course, iconic. Amazing food, not even just so much for the pioneering role, but just, excuse me, really, really good Oaxacan food. Before this, because I came out on Kevin Bean in the morning, so before this, I went to my favorite burrito, my favorite burrito stand in Southern California, Lucy's Drive-In on the cor corner of Pico and La Brea. Their chile relleno burrito washed down with orange bang. Oh, that is magnificent, absolutely magnificent. After I'm done here, I'm going to go to Olvera Street. I'm going to, uh, because the LA, I'm going to talk to the LA Times about something, but we're going to meet up at Cielito Lindo. Those iconic little taquitos with the avocado salsa. The family's from Zacatecas, not from Jerez, even though their last name's Guerrero. Sorry, that's only for the, those of us from Jerez. No one else gets it. It's okay. But so you have to try Cielito Lindo and so many, so many, I mean, the list could go on and on. I talk a lot of, about a lot of these. One final, one final place you should go to, we should all just go as a pilgrimage, would be Meat La Cafe, the place that originated the Taco Bell taco. You compare their taco to the, what Taco Bell created and like you weep. You really do weep. <laughs> because that Ur taco, oh my God, it's magnificent. They make them fresh. So they get a, fr a fresh handmade corn tortilla. They stuff it with a combination of actual beef, not Taco Bell beef, which is 85% a cow, mashed potatoes, they fry it fresh, they take it out, put some lettuce, put some a blizzard of yellow shredded yellow cheese, some tomatoes. It's airy. That, that crunch is just airy and juicy and wonderful. And it's a class, I mean, it's 75 years old it's, and it's in the west side barrio of San Bernardino. So it's just old school Chicano food. It's the type of place where Everyone's Mexicano, but everyone's speaking English. And the jukebox, goes, the jukebox will go from Vicente, Vicente Fernandez from one song to uh, Love Will Tear Us Apart in the other song. <laughs> Classic Southern California Mexican food. Anyways, I could go on and on. You all have to go on to other places. If you guys could make it to my evening lecture, I'm, also, I'm actually going to have it in Olvera Street at La Plaza tonight at 7 o'clock. There's going to be some of the people that I talk about in the book there, so it'll be really cool. And then there'll be an after party afterwards at Rivera. So thank you all so much. I really do appreciate it. It's meant so much for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll go over there and I'll talk to you all individually if you need to. Thanks. Over there.